Welcome everyone. You've made it to the end of our webinar showing the bacterial and viral bioinformatics resource centers. This is brought to you by the University of Chicago, Argonne National Lab, the J. Craig Venter Institute, the University of Virginia, and the Fellowship for the Interpretation of Genomes. And it's paid for by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So the BVDRC is a combination of the bacterial and viral bioinformatics resource centers. The bacterial is formerly known as Patrick and the viral is Viper and IRD. And today in this last series, we're going to be talking about tools and services. So just to recap it briefly, we've had several webinars, all of which are available through the help tab on our website. And this is our last one on April 1st. And hopefully it won't be very foolish if you all know this day that we sort of celebrate in the United States. I wanted to make you aware that we also have another webinar series in progress. It's about ticks and their pathogens. Now you may not work on ticks, you may not work on their pathogens, but this series might be of interest to you because it's showing different data, tools, and resources that are available not only in the BBBRC, but also in our sister BRC, ViewPath BB, which looks at the vectors of disease like ticks and mosquitoes and the eukaryotic pathogens like malaria and trypanosoma. For this particular series, you need to register by going to the URL that you can see at the bottom of the page, or if you go to view path, you'll be able to find it. As we combine the bacterial and viral BRCs, it's very important that we hear from you. The bacterial people, having used Patrick, you're not gonna have any problems at all with BVBRC. It's all gonna look very familiar to you. The viral people, you're gonna need a little bit of help. And so when you get stuck, please contact us so that we can help you with your problems. But to all of the researchers that use our system, this is your chance to tell us what you like, what you hate, and what you would like to see in the resource. Right now we're in the beta version. We're working on improving uh, the resource for you. So let us know what you want. To do that, click on the Help tab at the top of any page in BBBRC. This opens a drop-down box and you click on Contact Us. This will open a pop-up window where you have three tasks. You need to put something into the subject. You need to put something into the dialog box. And then you need to click that blue submit button that you see at the bottom and that comes to us directly. And we may contact you back, but we'll try to help you with whatever, well, we will contact you back, but we'll try to help you with whatever your issues are and take into serious account anything that you have asked for. Oops, there we go. So today we're gonna to be talking, as I said, about the tools and services. I wanna give you a brief history of the bioinformatics services that we've been providing in the BRC. We're gonna talk about how heavily those are used. And then I thought I would just focus in on one particular service because we have a lot of them and I don't wanna overwhelm you. But you'll notice, well, as you get more experience with use our services, that the job submission, the monitoring, the progress of the job, and the way to view the results, all those are very pretty, pretty similar between all our tools. So once you start mastering one, the other ones we hope will come to you more intuitively. And then I'll show you how your data is virtually integrated. And then Anna, my outreach co-liaison, will step you through the SARS coronavirus comprehensive genome analysis service that we have. So we've been providing bioinformatics services through the BRCs or through the, the BBBR, well, first it was Patrick, 
since 2015. And, and as you can see at the right along the legend, it shows you when the service, what the services were and when they were launched. So for example, in 2015, when it all began, we had annotation, assembly, differential expression, which allows you to bring different data like microarray data in and use our heat maps to examine it. Proteum comparison, model reconstruction, and RNA-seq. So each year we've added different tools and you can see each year, regardless of the number of tools we've had, the services are getting more and more heavily used. In 2021, we almost had 350,000 jobs launched by you, by the the research community, not by us, in that particular year. The latest jobs that we've added, including gene tree, multiple sequence alignment, metacaps, and primer design, all came from the Viper and IRD resources. And so they we haven't they haven't had enough time really to gain a lot of traction, but we're hoping that you'll use those too. When you look at this and the number of hits per month, we're getting around just under 30,000 jobs submitted by the research community each month in 2021. And you can see just from this graph how we're, uh, in, how we're becoming more popular and more and more researchers are using us. For all of these we do, well, not all of them, but for a number of the services that we have, we have a free online course geared towards bacterial researchers that's on Coursera that we encourage you to look at, especially if you have any problems later today or any questions. Of course, reach out to us with the questions, but this class is free and it's um, in short segments that you can take and just take those that are of interest to you to show you how to upload data, um, launch services and interpret the download information. So our top three services are annotation by far, way outstrips the other, assembly, and then one that we launched in 2018 that's a combination of those two called the Comprehensive Genome Analysis Service. And I thought I would start with that today because um, that's uh, It'll show you two services in one, and the format of it is similar to our other services. So we're going to need to go to bb-brc.org and get started. So there'll be a moment of blackness. Let me put that away and move that away. Okay. So. Here we are at the home landing page. And if you've been watching the webinar series, you've seen all of this before. I'm gonna blow it up a bit so you can see. I'm gonna to try to blow it up a little bit. Let's see, there we go. To me, the things I use the most often, uh, I often sometimes go into the organisms tabs, but I rely heavily on the tools and services and on the workspace, any registered user of BBRC gets their own workspace and they also have access to public workspaces and they can create collaborative spaces with other, um, with other researchers in the collaborative workspace. Well, let's go into tools and services and you see we offer a number of genomics tools, some protein tools, metagenomic tools that are increasing in popularity, transcriptomic tools, and then other utilities like ID Mapper, where you can grab identifiers from a different resource, put them in here and find, put them into the ID Mapper tool and find out what they correspond to in the BBBRC. And even most importantly is the FASTQ utilities, which will tell you the quality of your reads, which we find as more and more people are doing sequencing data, this is, becomes more and more important to them to figure out how good their data is. You notice that some of these services end in a B. That means it's limited to bacteria only. Some of them end in a B. 
that means that they're limited to viruses only. And some of them don't have anything after them. So that means you can use those resources with both bacterial and viral data. So let's click on the Comprehensive Genome Analysis Service. So I'm going to click on that here. And first of all, you'll, you'll notice that you can start with reads or assembled contigs. Now, how did we come up with the service? We had attended and given, not attended, we'd given a ton of workshops. And researchers would often get confused migrating between assembly and annotation. And um, the thing that was most confusing to them or the thing we realized they weren't getting was if their data was any good or not, or if they should continue on with it. So we asked them a lot of questions and sat, sat with them and asked them what they needed. And this service came out of it. And especially the downloadable files that are part of this service that I'll show you at the end, those were an important thing that we gleaned from talking to people who were using our resource to find out what they needed. And these kind of reports that you'll see that we provided with this service are the kinds of things we're working on providing for other things within the resource. So we're going to start today with an example of doing an assembly and an annotation. And this combines the two different assembly and annotation um, services. If I were to go here, I could do an assembly independently. And we might as well click on that so you can see it. And I could do an annotation independently. But this combines the two, so there's not as much clicking. Granted, there's always going to be clicking, but you won't have to be migrating between tools as much. So because we're starting with read files, that's what's been selected. Now, you notice that we allow you to put in paired reads single reads or an accession number for the sequence read archive or it used to be called the short read archive that's uh we used to you used to have to download the data from the sra and then upload it onto your computer well download it onto your computer and then upload it into the resource now we just allow you to enter the access the run number here and it's so you, it saves you from all of that. So if you've used the resource before and you've uploaded data before, you could click on the down arrow to find things you had done most recently. You could start typing in information that will try to match that, or you can navigate to your workspace. You're gonna need to navigate to the workspace if the data is already there or if you need to upload it. So I'm going to click on this folder and I have some files ready for you and there's going to be a little bit of navigation. So I apologize for that. Here you're seeing my private workspace. When you do this, it's going to look a little different and hopefully it'll look a little cleaner than mine. But I've been using this for a long time, so it's accumulated some clutter. But the data I want to show you today is in our public workspace. So I would click on this down arrow, click on public workspaces, and you notice the icon has changed in front of the words. And that's global indicating that it's public, open to the entire world. So I'm gonna drill or scroll down until I see the BVBRC workshop data. So I click on that. And this is for the workshops that we've been giving with the resource. And I've got different folders for each of those things that we show when, when I give a workshop. I'm going to click on the folder for comprehensive genome analysis. And I've got a number of different examples here. But for today, we want to do these staphylococcus reads. So let's click on that. And then we've got a number of reads here. This is a long read. And these are two base. Uh, the paired read, short read, paired, paired short read files. So because I was in the paired file um, section, I'm going to click on one of those and then click on OK. And here it's appeared in the box. 
I have to do that navigation again to get there. So I click on workspaces, public workspace, and then BVBRC workshop, comprehensive genome analysis. I know lots of clicking that particular staff assignment and then click on the other pair. Now, let me point out, if I wanted to upload data here, I would put in the upload icon and that way it'd be nestled safe and secure in a particular folder within your workspace where you'd know right where it was. But we're gonna use this for today's example. So I click okay. And now I've checked the numbers. They're the same read files, they're paired. So this is very similar to many of our tools. You make a selection, you up, bring the data up into this holding area but then you have to move it by clicking on this arrow here to a library box, a selected library box. And generally the service is looking here when it wants to run the analysis. It's This is the data that it's going to look at. So I want the other read files too. So I click on it again and now it remembers where I was. So I don't have to do all that navigation. So I'm gonna get that that file and then this file and so I've got now move this over so I have two paired read files in the selected library well remember there's also a long read file I'm sure most of, probably all of you know this but if you have enough money this is the best way to do a sequence you do a lot or at least for bacteria you do a long read like a pack bio that gives you length and a great span of distance, but it generally, it may not be so good in the details. So if you at the same time can do Illumina reads, that creates a, a beautiful um, assembly generally. And we allow you to do that in the BBBRC. So to get the long read file, I click on the folder and oh, I have to navigate again. So I go to public workspaces, Scroll down to BBBRC workshop, click on comprehensive genome analysis, click on staff reads, and here the one that doesn't have a one or two after it, that's my guy. So I click on that and then click OK. And then you know what I have to do. I've got to move that guy over to the box. So now there are the files that I want to build my assembly with, but you're not done yet you have some more decisions to make. So let's scroll down to the parameters box. If we had opened assembly and annotation, you'd see that this is a combination of the parameters from both of those services. So first we have to choose a strategy. You can say BBBRC, you take the reins, you choose it for me and just leave it at auto. Or you can click the down arrow and make a decision. Now, when you look at those, those assembly uh, recipes, these aren't anything that we have developed. These are the gold standard for the communities of um, bacterial researchers that they're doing for their assembly methods. Unicycler, which is for hybrid or short read. Spade, which is for hybrid or short read. Canoe, which is for long read. And then the three spades derivatives. Metaspades is for metagenomic sequences. Plasmid spades is trying to pull a good plasmid out of your data and then for single cell assembly. I really like unicycler. Uh, it takes longer than spades. You know, I'm not really sure why I like it. Maybe it's just because I like the name of it, but let's choose unicycler today. You can decide, do I want to trim the reads before assembly or not? Every step, these are the, these are the defaults. Every change I make that's increasing things, it's going to make that assembly take a little bit longer, but I don't care. Yes, I want them to be trimmed. Then I have to decide about the iterations. So what are those things? If you have, when an assembly is first generated, there's going to be places in there that it can't call a nucleotide. And so an iteration is when it comes back in with the reads again after it's first created the first assembly and says, is there enough data here so I can move this from an N to an AC or a T or a G? 
Raccoon is for the long reads. Pylon iterations is for the short read. Now, generally, our default is at two of those. If you increase it, it's going to take longer. The minimum contig length and the minimum contig coverage, those are generally things that GenBank requires when you submit data to them. So we just provide that. So let's just leave these where they are. Then you need the domain. And if you click down, you can see you can do bacteria, archaea, or viruses. Well, this is a staph example, so it's definitely bacteria. You need the taxonomy name. If you know the taxonomy ID, go ahead and insert it, but I don't have that memorized. So I start typing in here, staphy, and look, it's trying to help me. It's so friendly. And hopefully I'm spelling staphylococcus. Hopefully, oh, good, okay. So if I can, you don't have to put anything here. I mean, except bacteria, that's what you wanted. But let me tell you that it, if you can at all get it to genus, then you get two flavors of protein families. When you do a bacterial annotation in BBBRC, we generate cross genus protein families and every, every genome that comes through here gets the cross genus families. And that can be good for comparing things at a broader level. But if you're looking within a particular genus and you're doing a deep dive within that, you also want the local families, which are more fine grain. So the cross families we call our PG fams, the local families we call our PL fams. You will not get PL fams unless you put the taxonomy name here. And so you see it already knew what the taxonomy ID was. Now I have to give it a unique identifier. So I'll call this BB BRC webinar series. I know it's a dumb name, but I've annotated this a number of times. So, you know, I'm trying to be creative in some sense, but you notice as I type here, it's appearing here. So if I do that, you'll see that those are coming in and that's what it's going to be called. You're making the decision here. That's what it's going to be called in the endpoint. The genetic code, if you click in the down one for bacteria, you have um, three choices. Uh, I'm, it's, this, this will do for this. And then for the output folder, you could navigate to your workspace to create a folder, which maybe I'll do here. So I do that and I will create a new folder and I'll call it BBBRC webinar test. So I create that folder and then I could migrate down to find it. BB, there we go. Then click on that, click okay, there. And now look, the button, the submit button is blue, meaning you're ready to submit your job. So we have our libraries, we have our parameters, we're ready to go. So I click submit. And once it's been submitted, it'll give me a message saying, I'm in the process of submitting this job. Oh, your job's been successfully submitted. You need to go to your jobs list to check the status of your job. So job submission, pretty much the same on any of our services in BBBRC. You'll have this submit button. It'll give you a nice message telling you what to do next. So how do I get to my jobs page? Well, you can go up here into workspaces and click on my jobs, or you can go down here and click on the jobs. And here you can see how many I have queued, how many are running and how many are completed. So I'm gonna click on that. And here it's showing me that my job is running. Now this is an assembly and an annotation. Annotations are generally really fast when you have context generated. It might be an hour or less to do that annotation. Assemblies, not so much. And I get a lot of people writing to me saying, I submitted my assembly job an hour ago and I still don't have it. What's wrong with your service? 
Well, assemblies generally take around 24 hours to complete, but there are a lot of factors that go into that. One is the queue. You saw 30,000 jobs a month coming into the service. We all have to wait our turn and sometimes you're gonna be stuck in line waiting. Another thing is if your file size is really big, it's gonna take a while to, to run. And we keep, at first we were seeing repair files that were in uh, MB, but now they're GB and sometimes they get really large. Those things are gonna take a long time. So you're just gonna have to wait. Also, if you bring up uh, Rackon and Pylon iterations, that is also gonna increase the time. However, that being said, if it's been 24 hours and your assembly hasn't yet completed, go ahead and click on this row and report the issue to me so that I can check to see what's going on. Because sometimes there's an error on our side. So let us know if your job fails, also let us know that. So we've gone over job submission. We've gone over job monitoring. Now let's look at a completed job. Well, I have a number of completed jobs here that I could show you by just clicking on one and clicking view. But actually within the workspace, with it, within the file, I have this um, completed job. So there we go. So I click on the workspace tab and I click on the public workspaces. And then I'm gonna navigate down to BDBRC workshop. So I'll click on that. And then to comprehensive genome analysis. So I'll click on that. And then under the assignment staphylococcus reads, I'll click on that. And then you see this line that you couldn't see before when we were loading the reads. This is a completed job, one that I ran a while ago, but shared with this space um, yesterday. So when there's that checkered flag, it's like NASCAR, you know, when the cars are, well, maybe, or Formula One, because we have an international audience here. So it means that the job is completed. So let's click on that. And this is what a completed job looks like. And I'm gonna make this bigger. So you can see a lot of information is coming in with this. Up here, it's telling you what the job ID is, how long it took to run, which was six hours and nine minutes, which is pretty fast. And then I can see the parameters that I submitted with that. And there are a number of files here that we want to look at. Notice that it has, because we did an assembly and an annotation, there are two completed jobs within that that we'll look at in a moment. But what I really want to show you is this full genome report. This is the, the, this is, um, the byproduct of our interviewing researchers and asking them what they would like to see and how they could un better understand their data. So to see something like this, note that this, what the, this vertical green bar doesn't have much information. When I click here, it highlights the vertical green bar with possible downstream steps. And I want to look at this full genome report. So let's click on view. We have to wait for it to load. Generally, it's pretty quick, but of course, when you're being filmed, it's going to take a little bit longer, but here it is. So first, the first thing that people asked us for that we provided was an assessment. And it says here, this genome appears to be of good quality. If it's not good, it's going to tell you that. So, and it'll tell you some of the things about it below, but we're good to go with this. It looks like a good quality genome. We've got information about the assembly, including the number of contigs. So all those two read pair, the two paired read files and the long read files, they assemble together into two contigs and the amount, the how, the information about the assembly job. Then it gives you the information about the annotation job. And it went through, remember I put in staphylococcus for it but it did an analysis and it says, I think this is Staph aureus, it's right. So that was good, but I didn't tell it that. It just figured it out by comparing it to all the data that's in the resource. It gives you information about the annotation. 
and the genes that are called. It gives you the information about the proteins that are called, including if they have EC numbers, GO numbers, what kind of pathways they're assigned to, and how many protein families they have. And then it gives you a circular graph just to give you some information about it, showing you the forward strand in the outermost row, the reverse strand, the genes on that in the next row in, the RNA genes on the next row in, um, any genome, any bacterial genome that's annotated in BBBRC is blasted against specialty gene databases. One for antimicrobial, well, actually, there are a number for antimicrobial resistance, for virulence factors, for drug targets, for human homologs, and for transporters. In this diagram, this particular row shows you the uh, genes that hit those specialty genes for antimicrobial resistance. The next one is virulence factors, and then we have GC content and GC skew. And you'll notice that there are colors on these rows too. And if you look down, those colors are related to an analysis of the functionality of those genes, which we call a subsystem analysis. So for example, all of the genes that appear to be evolved in protein processing are in orange. And if I went back here, I could see like there's a big block of orange genes here on the reverse strand. So it's just for fun and for information for you. Then it goes into telling you about those blasts I told you about to the specialty databases. And these are the genes that had hits to the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database, NARDO, the Patrick Antibiotic Resistance Database, and so on for the drug targets, transporters, and virulence factors. Another thing we provide is prediction of antimicrobial resist resistance phenotypes. For certain genera within the resource, we've gone out and we've looked for papers that describe uh, large studies looking at a particular genus or species where they are doing them against panels of antibiotic resistance. So, Often, the, well, almost always, what the researchers do, because it would be problematic to put that data in GenBank, they put it in the sequence read archive. When we find those, we grab that data out of the sequence read archive, we assemble it, and we annotate it so that we can run our own machine learning processes on it to try to predict, uh, see, find areas of the genome that are associated with antimicrobial resistance or susceptibility. After that effort, we have good data for Staphylococcus, among other things, Mycobacterium 2, and there are several others. But it's predicted that my genome is resistant to penicillin and then susceptible to all of these other things. We also have done a CABR-based analysis of antimicrobial genes and we look at those too. And so it's looking within my genome and it's saying, hey, you have some genes that are important in antimicrobial resistance in these particular categories. And here's what those genes are. And then finally, we do a quick, I call it a quick and dirty tree because it's only based on five genes that your genome comes in, it tries to figure out who its closest relatives are, and then based on five genes, it generates a tree. Now, I wouldn't use this in a publication. I would want to do a more, because five genes seems weak to me. I'd probably go for 100. But it gives you an idea of where it stands, and it also gives you an idea if you have contamination. And then at the bottom, you'll see we have a ton of references, which were included above in the report. What we want is for you to be happy with the resource and be able to publish easily. And these are, so we've created this so that you can just come in and find for, for RAST, for the annotation, here's the reference. And for a number of things, if for the virulence factors, all of these things for the, for the protein families, they're all here. We want to make it easy for you because when you're happy and publishing, 
That makes us happy. It makes our program officer happy and it keeps the whole resource going. So that's the report that we've generated. Now I can click up, click up to here's in the breadcrumb and go back to the um, back to the other things. So I could look at the assembly job by clicking on this checkered flag. And it's showing me the details of the assembly job, which include the contigs and an assembly report, which is actually kind of, well, now that I've mentioned it, I'll show it to you. It's a little bit boring. It's just telling you information about the reads. It gives you a direct link to the cost reports, which would give you quality scores. It shows you different things. And at the bottom, okay. It's not that boring because it's got this cute bandage plot. I don't know that these are useful for anything, but I just think they're adorable. And it's showing you the two contexts that it was able to resolve. So, okay, it wasn't that boring because um, I think the bandage plots are really cute. And then I could click on the annotation. And this to me is more valuable, maybe not to everyone, but I like this. So I click on that. And, you know, a lot of stuff comes in with these, these things. And if you look in the help section and then go to tutorials, I go into exhaustive detail about what each of these individual files have within them. But I just wanted to show you the things that I like the best, which is the genome report.html. So I highlight that row and I click on the view icon and it's showing me the information about my genome. Here's its name. Here's its unique identifier within the resource. This is the genome that it was compared to in the annotation service. And you could click on that if you were interested and see who that guy was. And here it is, whatever the mu3 genome is, but it looked like it would be, it was a good quality genome that it was compared against. These are the things that I always look for, completeness, contamination, and also um, over-present rules and under-present rules. Those are genes that were called that seem to be problematic for one reason or another. So that these are potentially problematic roles. Roles equals genes in BBBRC speak. And so it's telling you this, like for example, this first gene, it was predicted that we shouldn't have any of those, but we had one and here's the gene and he, this is a direct link to it and it's on this context. So if I were to click this, it would open up a new tab that would show me that problematic gene, problematic and that we didn't expect it to be there. So when I see things that I didn't expect to be there, my mind is thinking, oh, I wonder if there's lateral transfer involved in this. But, you know, I'm always looking for things like that because I like that. And when I see a bunch of these things here, it makes me start thinking of that. But you'll also see things like, oh, we thought you'd only have one of these genes, but you have two of them. And then I noticed that they're on the same contig and that they're right next to each other because this is in the gene called was gene number 1058 and this is gene 1059. To me that immediately rings my frame shift or, or, um, or uh, nonsense mutation that we've got a potential pseudo gene here. So those are just the kind of ways you can use this kind of information. And as you scroll down to the bottom, it, well, I also like this, it goes through all the context and tells you where, you know, that there are some genes that look problematic here and you could get a list of all of them just by clicking there. It'll show you all the genes that it found a bit problematic. So that's the genome report. So we've been through, let's just step back to the original job. We've been through the full genome report, the annotation, and the assembly report. So how is, can you view your data within the resource? Well, you saw that I was clicking on those individual genes and genome IDs, and that was taking me to a genome page. 
But if I click on annotation up here, you see these links, this will take me to a genome landing page, which you would have seen in the first webinar of this series. This would be the table of all the genes, and this would be the genome browser. Actually, I like to see the genome landing page, so let me click on that. And here's the gene, and this is all the information, or sorry, here's the genome, and this is all the information that you saw in, um, in the, the report, but here it is, you know, remember we talked about the predicted resistance, the protein features, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all here for you to look at. And if you own this gene, you notice that there we don't have, or this genome, you notice that we don't have this type of information because it's my private genome. I could go in and click that edit box and enter things, um, enter data if I so wished. And so that I think is it right now for this particular service, which remember was the Comprehensive Genome Analysis Service, which was a combination of assembly and annotation. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and let Anna talk about the SARS uh, Coronavirus Comprehensive Genome Analysis Service. So Anna, if you're ready, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can take it away. All right, um, I am still here, but I do need permission to share my screen. If you guys could let me do that. Try now. Okay, that sounds good, looks good. And all right, you should be seeing my screen and I apologize, my webcam has decided to go on the fritz this week. Um, but yeah, I'll be talking to you about the viral services because bacteria are cool, but viruses are always cooler. Um, and so we do have some services underneath the tools and services tab that are geared specifically towards viruses. And while the comprehensive genome analysis service uh, mainly deals with bacteria and bacteriophages, um, we do have the SARS-CoV-2 genome assembly and annotation pipeline that works in a similar way um, to, to the comprehensive genome analysis pipeline. And eventually we'd like to be able to extend um, the comprehensive genome analysis service to all viruses, but uh, we decided to start with SARS-CoV-2 given its importance to everybody's life these days. Um, so it's got a pretty similar interface, you can see, and um, I'd like to point you guys to the quick reference guide and the tutorial that Rebecca put together. And these are really useful to kind of give you an idea of one, uh, the different assembly workflows that are available. Um, and we've got um, CDC Illumina, Nanopore, and Arctic Nanopore. And we also have the one codex um, pipeline, but we need to update this, um, this quick reference to include that. And this just gives you an idea of the different tools that are used for read trimming, for the read mapping, and the variant calling. And then eventually, um, the consensus sequence is generated. And we also um, run that through our annotation service, which is a viral um, annotation software developed at JCVI called Vigor4. And what's nice about this is that it, in addition to the open reading frames that um, are generally found in NCBI, we've also added uh, a few extra uh, open reading frames that um, sometimes are left out like ORF9B, um, and for some of these genes, there's experimental evidence that they're expressed and some not, but that's uh, noted in the annotation files. So it just goes through how to use the annotation service. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, there's a list of all of the different output files because there's quite a few and it tells you exactly what they are. So going back to the service page, um, there's also a tutorial um, that you, know, you can go through at your leisure and um, get an idea of uh, how to use the service. So 
Uh, you can again start with read files or assembled contigs if you've already assembled them through another service, for example. Um, but for these examples, I'm going to use read files. And again, as Rebecca said, you can either put paired reads, uh, single reads, or SRA um, run numbers. You can input them directly. So I thought I would give you a few examples of some different types of reads because um, you, you end up with a lot of different, um, your results can vary depending on what kind of input you put in. Um, so I thought I would start with, um, let's see, we've got, so if you're wondering uh, where to get these reads, you can get them from um, the sequence read archive at NCBI. And my example is going to be um, some paired end reads that were um, analyzed on an Illumina NovaSeq 6000 platform. And these are Amplicon based, so meaning the primers that they used were specific uh, to amplify SARS-CoV-2. So you put in your um, SRA run uh, accession number, and um, that's, that's important in that um, the number is not uh, the, the accession number for the um, for the, the, this entry, but it's actually the run number. So just be careful that you're inputting uh, this number over here. And you just go ahead and click on this arrow to make sure it moves into your selected libraries box. And so this is a pretty simple pipeline. Um, there's much fewer options than with a bacterial comprehensive analysis pipeline. You can uh, choose your strategy in the parameter box. And um, we have several pipelines that are mentioned. And again, these are uh, established pipelines in the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing community. And they include one codex, um, the CDC Illumina and Nanopore pipelines and the Arctic Nanopore pipeline. But um, I'm lazy, so I'm just gonna leave it on the auto select one. You don't need to do anything with the taxonomy name or tax ID because these are already specified here. Um, you can give your output uh, a name. So April 1, and you just uh, specify your, uh, your output folder. And it, Rebecca's already shown you how to select and um, create folders. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, do that. And when you have all the fields filled out, your submit button should um, become available to click. So you can just go ahead and click submit. And if you're uh, someone who's been using Viper or IRD, uh, you might expect your um, job to turn up on the same page, but you'd actually have to go and find it by looking at the bottom corner here where you can see your jobs and you can double click on that, or you can go up to uh, the workspaces and click on uh, my jobs. And so you can go ahead and uh, see that this is running here and it'll take a few minutes, but it's usually uh, quite quick, but I've already assembled this. So I'm just gonna scroll down to um, complete a job so that you can see what the results look like today. Um, so you again have a bunch of files that come out after the job is completed. You have the full genome report as an HTML file. You have the consensus uh, contig that's generated as a FASTA file, and you can click on that and just uh, download it if you want to. Um, you've got the annotated genome that you can also download. And then uh, you have two, completed jobs here, one of which is the assembly job. And if you double click on that, um, that has its own uh, file list. And again, you can um, go through the documentation if you want to find out what every single one of these uh, files are. And um, if you go back, um, you can also look at the results of the Vigor 4 annotation job and, um, you know, click on the, the file that you're interested in. For example, if I double click on um, 
the output peptide file and click on view. Um, that will give me a list of um, the annotated proteins if you just want those. But um, like Rebecca said, the HTML files are actually uh, quite useful. So if you just click on uh, the full genome report, that will take you to a page that summarizes the results of this assembly and annotation job. Uh, so it's telling you that um, it's run the Pangolin software on this to basically give you um, specification of which pangolinage it belongs to. And so this belongs to AY4. So this run had um, the Delta variant in it. It tells you that uh, it passed the quality control measures of the Pangolin software. And we also um, add the Scorpio, which is um, an additional way to kind of predict um, what the pangolinage is with more accuracy. And that gives you the specifications from the output over here. And again, you can uh, read a little bit more about uh, the pangolin software um, on, the, on their sites. The next table gives you an idea of the SNPs that were called from the assembly job. And again, we can see the pretty typical um, expected SNPs from what we would see in a, in a Delta variant genome. And they're um, listed depending on the genes. So here we have the spike gene, the ORF1A, ORF3A, et cetera. And if you scroll down, you can see a table on the assembly statistics, how long it took, uh, which recipe it used, um, which platform, it was assembled on the number of indeterminate nucleotides and um, individual uh, indeterminate nucleotides and the number of long stretches of ends um, that you might expect from things like amplicon dropout regions. And if you scroll down, there's, um, there's a nice figure that is quite handy to give you an idea again of the coverage depth for your assembly job. And this one, was a pretty good um, was a pretty good sample. So we've got high coverage for most of the regions. If you go along the genome from about zero to thirty kb, except towards the end terminus where there's a couple dropout regions. If you keep scrolling down, you'll get um, the variation data from uh, the variant caller, telling you the individual sites and positions where there's um, changes from uh, the Wuhan Who one reference genome that's used. Um, and if you scroll along uh, to the other end of the table, you can see that um, it'll give you the, the protein or the amino acid changes in the reference genome, as well as in your assembled genome. And if you scroll down even further, um, you'll find the annotation report and it'll show you uh, which proteins were annotated and where. Um, so, you know, SARS-CoV-2 has the ORF1A and ORF1AB proteins. And one of the things that we also do is add annotation for the mature peptides. So um, both ORF1A and ORF1AB are polyproteins that are cleaved into um, smaller proteins. And those um, can be listed, are listed over here, laser protein and SP2. And um, you can tell which one is a mature peptide by looking at um, the ID over here. So the CDS would be uh, the coding sequence and then um, the mature peptide is listed here. So we've got the spike protein. And then uh, we have a couple of alternate open reading frames that um, we've extracted from the literature, but um, there's still no strong experimental evidence that they're expressed. So ORF2B is, um, is an alternate open reading frame in the spike protein, um, ORF3D, ORF3D uh, uh, minus two and ORF3B. Um, and then if you scroll down, ORF9B is a protein that um, there is quite good experimental evidence that it's expressed, but it's not always um, it's not always annotated in uh, most 
uh, genomes that you'll find in uh, the GenBank or in GISAID. So that's just an additional feature that you can expect from this pipeline. And then it just gives you a little bit of the metadata that was extracted from the SRA uh, entry. So um, I have a couple of other, we've got five minutes left. So I'm just gonna quickly show you um, the output of a couple of other um, types of samples. And one of them uh, is from a wastewater sample. So as you know, a lot of people have been uh, doing wastewater monitoring for SARS-CoV-2, and they also use amplicon-based um, sequencing to generate these genomes and to look for SARS-CoV-2. So in this case, the report is a little bit different. And uh, what you can expect from it is um, also a little bit different. So your, your output really is always going to depend on your input. So in this case, um, the Pangolin software determines that it's an Omicron lineage, which is uh, BA11. And your SNPs are obviously going to differ from, um, from the last sample. And here we have our 20 plus mutations in the spike genome that we've come to expect with Omicron. But if we look at our coverage uh, charts, it's quite different for, for the sample. And we have much, much lower coverage for most of the regions that we're looking at. So um, we're obviously going to expect um, this genome assembly to be of much lower quality. And we can also see that reflected in the number of ends in the assembly and um, a higher number of the end blocks in the assembly. And then just quickly, I'll show you um, another example the last example in this um, that I had for you today. And this one comes from a metagenomic sample of an oronasopharyngeal swab. So basically they're using random primers to just amplify everything um, in, this, in this one entry. And um, if you go over here and I'll input the the accession number. So the results are coming from, um, like I said, a metatranscriptomic sample with uh, random PCR primers. And just to give you an idea of what's in here, uh, you can go to um, the analysis and you can see that only 0.43% of this sample has viral reads in it. And from those, um, only about maybe 0.2 to 0.4% are SARS-CoV-2. So let's see what that looks like in our assembly pipeline. So in this case, um, the Pango software wasn't able to determine a lineage and that's likely because, um, you know, it's, it's a really poor quality assembly. And um, we have some SNPs, but again, um, I'm not sure I would have much faith in the genome assembled from this because you can see that there's quite a large number of ends in the assembly and um, you know there's very low uh, coverage depth for it. And so, so it, it really depends on what, what sample you input matters. Um, <clears throat> and one of the ways you can get an idea of um, what's in your sample is by looking at, uh, by running FASTQ utilities on your, um, on your either SRA run number or on your FASTQ files. But with that, I will stop and see if we have any questions. We have one question asking about in the chat how many gigabytes people could upload into their workspace right now. We do not have limits on that. You could also upload your samples to SRA and just uh, use our run numbers if, if that's a concern. But. 
So a couple of other things um, that I just wanted to mention that we offer, if you again want to explore what's in a sample is um, one, the FASTQ utilities, which will give you an idea of how good your sample is. And the other thing you can do is run a taxonomic classification on metagenomic samples to kind of get an idea of what's in um, your sample in terms of percentage of bacterial pathogens or viral pathogens. Um, there's a question on how to cite DVBRC. Is it the same as the Patrick citation when we publish? That's a good question. Well, we haven't yet created a joint publication yet for BBBRC. So for now, until we do that, which um, I'm not sure when the limits are for the NAR database issue, and if, you know, for this mm -hmm. year, I, I don't think so. For now, please do the standard Patrick, the standard Viper IRD. Um, actually, actually, we have a um, we have a link in the under uh, about us. There's a citation, and it's asked to cite um, the bacterial and viral bioinformatics resource center BVBRC. Uh -oh. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll send the link out here in just a second. Okay. Okay. So if you go to the about tab and click on citation that will take you to this page. And I guess, depending on this tool that you're using, um, you can cite either the website itself and just provide the link until we put together a publication on the BVBRC. If you're using a specific tool on Patrick um, or IRD or Viper, um, you can use the following publications. But thank you for asking. Just so everybody knows, I know we only covered one, one tool. We are going to be doing webinars, smaller ones on each of the tools um, to make it easier for you, shorter than this hour, hopefully, that if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll be notified when they've launched or you can monitor them by going into the help and then webinars and you'll be able to see them there. You can also scroll down to the bottom of the page and follow us on our social media sites, um, on Twitter, um, Facebook, or Reddit to hear announcements about webinars or, or any new videos that we post. Or you can go directly to our YouTube channel and just subscribe to that. And we're going to be posting tutorials as well as recordings of these and other webinars on the site.